Hey guys, it's Nick, and this video is an update on the FBAR filing process and the requirements for calendar year 2021. I'm going to explain what FBAR is, how it differs from IRS Form 8938, who is required to file, the different types of financial accounts that are included in the reporting requirements, and how to calculate the yearly account balance in your accounts and the official way that you have to convert these balances in foreign currencies into US dollars for the FBAR filing. And at the end of this video, I will do my own FBAR filing to show you all the steps as I do it. So if you wanna skip to certain sections, I have the chapters listed in the description box below. Now, before we start, I'm not a CPA or a tax attorney, and this is not financial advice or tax advice. Do your own research or consult a professional if you have any questions. So what is FBAR and how is it different from IRS Form 8938? Well, FBAR is a form that you must file with FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. It has nothing to do with the IRS or taxes. So the IRS form 8938 gets filed with your tax returns. And I did a video on that if you want to know more about it. FinCEN doesn't care about your stock profits, your capital gains, or the transactions during the year, or how much interest your accounts earned. Whether you made any transactions in your accounts or not is irrelevant. They just want to know all the foreign financial accounts that you owned during the calendar year and what was the maximum value of each of those accounts during the year. So you are required to file an FBAR if you are a U.S. citizen, a U.S. resident, a corporation, a partnership, an LLC, or a trust and estate. So if you are any one of those and your foreign financial accounts totaled over 10,000 US dollars during the year, then you need to file an FBAR. If the high value of all your foreign accounts were over 10,000 US dollars at any time during the year, then you have to file an FBAR and include every account, even if it has only a few dollars in it. I will give visual examples of how this works a little later in the video. So now let's see what a foreign financial account actually is. So first, I want people to understand the difference between a foreign financial account and an account in the U.S. in a foreign financial company. So HSBC is a foreign bank in Hong Kong. If you have an account in a Hong Kong branch, that is a foreign financial account. However, HSBC has branches in the U.S., if you happen to open your account at a HSBC branch in the US, that is not considered a foreign financial account and is not reportable on FBAR. Similarly, Citibank is a US bank. And if your account is in Citibank in the US, it's not a foreign financial account. However, this US company has branches in other countries like Colombia, if you went to Colombia and opened a Citibank account in Colombia, even though this is an American bank, it's in a foreign country, and therefore that is considered a foreign financial account and is reportable on FBAR. So now that we know the difference, what are the accounts that they're talking about in these foreign financial accounts? So you have bank accounts such as savings, checking accounts, and time deposits. Securities accounts, such as stock brokerage accounts, securities derivatives, options, or commodity futures. Insurance policies with a cash value, such as whole life insurance policies. Foreign mutual funds or similar pooled funds. Now, a lot of people ask if retirement accounts are included in this. They are not included if they are part of a government retirement plan. So if the plan is kind of like Social Security, where you just get a check from the government, but you don't actually decide where to direct investments, then that is not a reportable account. But if you have a 
type of like a 401k or an IRA equivalent in another country outside of the US where you put money in and you direct where those investments go, then that is considered a foreign financial account that is reportable on FBAR. So if you don't have control to direct the investments, then it is not a reportable account. And so examples of this are correspondent Nostro accounts owned by a government entity, owned by an international financial institution, maintained on a United States military banking facility, held in an individual retirement account that you own or are beneficiary of, held in a retirement plan of which you're a participant or beneficiary or part of a trust of which you're a beneficiary if a U.S. person files an FBAR reporting these accounts. Now, you don't need to file an FBAR for the calendar year if all your foreign financial accounts are reported on a consolidated FBAR. Consolidated FBAR is used when you have like more than 25 accounts that are put all into one report. Also, you don't have to file if all your foreign financial accounts are jointly owned with your spouse and you completed and signed the FinCEN Form 114A authorizing your spouse to file on your behalf and your spouse reports the jointly owned accounts on a timely filed signed FBAR. In other words, if you and your husband have to file FBAR, you can have just one of you fill it out for the two of you as long as the other person filled out the authorizing form 114A. And I see a lot of people have questions about this that income tax filing status, such as married filed jointly and married filed separately, has no effect on your qualifications for this exception. So it doesn't matter how you file your income taxes with the IRS, you can still jointly file the FBAR with you and your spouse as long as they fill out this authorizing form. So now that we know what is considered a foreign financial account, Let's see what's not considered a foreign financial account and so does not have to be reported on FBAR. Number one is foreign owned real estate. So if you have an apartment in Spain or Thailand or wherever, you do not have to report it anywhere on FBAR. Also, if you have a safe deposit box in a bank in another country or even just one of those safe deposit box companies in another country, it is not reportable on FBAR. And if you happen to have cash, whether in US dollars or foreign currencies or precious metals like gold, silver bars, coins, anything like that, and they are in that safe deposit box or in your apartment or house in another country, anywhere outside of the country, they are also not reportable to FBAR. Now, the question on everybody's mind these days is what about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Do they have to be reported on FBAR? For the 2021 calendar year, they do not have to be reported on FBAR. I'm sure that's going to change in the future. I thought it would have changed by 2021, but so far it has not. So when you're filling out FBAR this year before April 15th for the 2021 calendar year, you do not have to include your cryptocurrencies that are held on foreign exchanges. Now, I'm sure they're going to change the reporting requirements and require cryptocurrencies to be filed on FBAR. And so if your cryptocurrency is on a foreign exchange like one of these, Binance, Bitfinex, all of these exchanges are in foreign countries so if your cryptocurrency was held in these you would have to file if they were held on u.s exchanges like coinbase bitrex binance us and these other ones then you would not need to file for fbar for these cryptocurrencies so now let's talk about how FinCEN wants you to calculate the high value of your account during the year. They talk about the high watermark. And so a lot of people are confused about this. So I think this is the best way to explain it. You see these canals in Venice or wherever, and you see the water level is over here, right? However, if you look on the wall over here, 
you can tell that the water used to be at some time as high as this level here. And that's what they're talking about. They want to know not where the water level is right now or on December 31st or January 31st. They don't care. They want to know the highest level it reached during the year. Whatever that level is, that's what you're going to put down for the high value of the account for that year. So let's look at it like this. Let's say this is a brokerage account you have and you have some stocks in there and whether you sell some or buy some during the year or do nothing, it makes no difference. They only care about the total value during the year. And so let's look at it from January 1st to December 31st. On January 1st, you start out somewhere, let's say around 3,000, it goes up to 6,000, falls back down, and now it goes up to, let's say, $8,000 in June, right? And after that, it continuously falls all the way down to like a dollar on December 31st. What does FinCEN say the maximum value of your account was during the year? They say it is this, this $8,000 level. This is the high water mark that your account achieved during the year. And that's what you're going to put on the FBAR filing for this particular account. Now, let me show you two different scenarios of how this works among multiple accounts to figure out the high watermark for your account and to see if you need to file an FBAR for your foreign accounts. So let's say you have four foreign accounts, bank number one, bank number two, brokerage number one, brokerage number two that has stocks. And this just has cash, checking, savings, CDs, whatever, right? These are all foreign accounts, but look, they only have, and this is a thousand dollar bill, by the way, in case you didn't know there was such a thing, there is, it's a thousand dollar bill. So these accounts have $2,000 in each account at the beginning of the year, right? So that's $8,000. It's not over the $10,000 threshold that you have to have in order to be required to file. So as it stands, you do not need to file an FBAR in this situation. However, let's take a look at some different situations here. So let's say you have this $8,000 total in all your accounts, but during the year, the stocks in your brokerage account started going up. So instead of 2,000, they went to 3,000, and then 4,000 and then 5,000. So now at some point during the year, it could be May or June, whatever, all your accounts are now 2,000, 2,000, 5,000, 2,000, which is $11,000, which now means you have to file an FBAR for these foreign accounts, each one of them, right? But what happens if before the end of the year, the gains in your brokerage account start to disappear? and they go right back down to the 2,000 that you had in there originally. So now your 5,000 goes down to 2,000, and now you're back to only having $8,000 in all these accounts. Do you say, oh, good, I don't have to file now because on December 31st or whatever, I only have $8,000 in these accounts? No, because this account hit $5,000, the high watermark for this account is five thousand dollars and remain so even if these go to zero so your total is still eleven thousand dollars no matter how much is left in here because it went there once and that's the high water mark now let's look at another example that people get confused about to see if they're required to file let's say it's the same situation at the beginning of the year you have two thousand in each of these foreign accounts which is $8,000 and not reportable. But sometime during the year, you take 1,000 from here and move it to here. And you take 1,000 from here and move it to here. So now you have 4,000 here, 1,000 here, 2,000 here, 1,000 here. That's still $8,000. You didn't make any more money or anything like that. You didn't add any money you still only have $8,000 in all these accounts. Do you have to file FBAR? Yes, you do, because 
The high watermark in these accounts are not 1,000. They are 2,000 because you had 2,000 in there originally. And this one is also 2,000 because you had 2,000 in there originally before you moved some money to this account. So the high watermark for all these accounts is now 4,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, which is $10,000. And so you have to file F bar for this. So now that you figured out that you need to file an F bar and you figured out the high watermark values for each of your accounts, you need to change it into US dollars if it is in a foreign currency in those accounts. So how do you do that? Let's go take a look at the website you need to use and calculate an example. So you get that information from the Treasury website and this is the website you need to go to. I will link it in the description below. But that information has moved since the last year. And so when I went there this year, they have this link and says the data has moved permanently to this link here. So let's click on that and it takes you to fiscaldatatreasury.gov. I don't recommend going to just this address because there are a whole lot of other things there that are kind of confusing to figure out which uh, actual page to go on. So follow the link that I have and then click that link and get here. And so now you come down here and click on one year and see treasury reporting rates of exchange. And so I'm going to use Singapore as an example. So here is Singapore. It says it's 1.352 Singapore dollars for each US dollars. And the way that FinCEN calculates this exchange is basically what they're saying is on the last day of the year, 12-31-2021, this is the exchange rate. And this is the rate you use for the whole year for your account. So even if the high watermark was in February or March or whatever, it doesn't matter. You use this exchange rate for any time during the whole year for the for that high watermark value. OK, so let's say you had 20,000 Singapore dollars in your account. You would divide that by the exchange rate that they gave you 1.352 and that would give you $14,792.90 in U.S. dollars. And you would round that up to 14,793 US dollars. And this is the amount that you would put on your F bar filing for this account. So now that you know how to figure out the values and the exchange rates, I'm going to go and file my own F bar to show you the steps as I do it. So let's actually go through the whole filing of my F bar. Go to fincen.gov. You get to this page. Click on here, e-filing, and it takes you to another website, BSA e-filing system. Scroll down and click on file F bar now. So you have two options, the PDF option or the online option. I've done the PDR option before and it is a pain in the neck with the online signatures. You have to have the right PDF editing software and all kinds of stuff. It always caused me problems. And a few years ago, they made this option available, which is much better. The only thing you need to know is that you have to have all your information because you cannot save anything. You have to do it all in one session. So here we go. So this part, self-explanatory, put your email address, confirm it, first name, last name, phone number. So after you put that information, click on start F bar, put a filing name, how you want to save it. You only have to fill in this info if you are late in filing. You have to file by April 15th, but there's an automatic extension to October 15th. So here it says this report is for the calendar year ended 12-31-2021. It's not amended. Type of filer. I'm an individual here. You put your social security number or if this is a partnership or LLC or a corporation, you would put your taxpayer identification number. After you do that, you select either EIN or SSN, ITIN. So 
I'm going to select social security number. If you have foreign identification, passport, whatever, put it in here. Then here you put your date of birth, your organization's name, if there is one, or just your last name and first name if you're an individual. And of course, just put your current address information here. Here it says, does the filer have financial interest in 25 or more financial accounts? Hopefully you put no, because that's a lot of accounts to fill out for. Does the filer have signature authority over, but no financial interest in 25 or more financial accounts? I put no. This would be the case signature authority. If you had some kind of power of attorney or something like that on somebody's accounts. So this section separate joint account is where most people are going to fill in their information. Part two is for accounts owned separately. Part three is for accounts owned jointly. So like if you are married, you can have one person fill out the account and the other person fill out the form that authorized them to file for both of you. Since I'm not married, I'm just going to focus on this section. And if you have more than one bank account or brokerage account, you just hit this plus sign to add another form to it to however many forms you need for how many accounts you have. So I usually start with the account with the highest value and here the maximum value, we're going to put the high watermark for the year after we did the exchange rate calculation. And this is going to be in US dollars rounded up to the next dollar of course. And you're going to put the type of account, bank account, securities account, or some other account. And if you put other, then they want some kind of explanation. But for me, it's going to be a bank account. So you put the bank name, your account number, the address and city and state and country and postcode of the bank. So after I filled out that information, I clicked on the plus sign and got another blank field here to put a second page of information if you have more than one bank or brokerage or financial account. So I put all of my four accounts in section two by adding more forms as I need it. And now I go down to part three and this doesn't apply to me. This is accounts owned jointly. So if you're married, you would fill this out just like the regular form, except here on 24, it says number of joint owners. So if you are just you and your wife, you would put two. And if you are the person filling it out and you have your wife filled out the form that allows you to fill this out for her as well, then you put your information here and just keep the form with you. You don't have to file it with this F bar, the approval form. And so now here, part four is information on financial accounts where a filer has signature or authority, but no financial interest in the account. Again, this is if maybe there's a, a trust or some kind of power of attorney or something along those lines, then you would fill out the regular information here, but then you put the owner information down here and I've never done this, so I don't know um, what you need to fill out, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, just the organization name, taxpayer ID, and all of that. And this is information on financial accounts where filer is filing a consolidated report. Consolidated report is when you have a whole lot of reports, I think over 25 or something like that. So something like a bank or somebody might do something along those lines and that's out of the scope of this video so if you have some kind of situation like that you probably should talk to an accountant or a tax attorney or something so this is where you sign the report now if you had an accountant or somebody do this for you you would check off this box here if this report is completed by a third party preparer and that third party preparer would fill in all their information down here. But if you did this form yourself, then you fill out only this section here. So this box for filer title is only if you're not reporting a personal account. So you would fill out the title if you're like the CFO or you have signature authority over the account or you are authorized to file on behalf of a legal entity like a corporation or something like that. So I leave that blank because I'm an individual filer. And date of signature, this is going to be auto-populated when you click on 
return to the home tab to sign the report. So scroll up to the second page where it says sign the form. So you click on sign the form and it says, I acknowledge that I am electronically signing the BSA report, okay. And then just click submit. And so you get a confirmation screen. What I like to do is take a screenshot of this because they give you a tracking ID and all this, your information here. So you have proof that you sent it in and then you can download a copy of your F bar in a PDF file, which I highly recommend because you have to keep a copy for at least five years for your records. So do both of these things. And that's it. The F bar filing is done and you will receive a confirmation email from them as well. I hope this video was helpful in giving you the knowledge you need to file your own F bar and save yourself some money. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching, guys.